All right, so we'll get started. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Gubbi Gubbi and Undambi people and the traditional country in which this event is taking place and the elders past and present. I also recognise those whose ongoing effort to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures will leave a lasting legacy for future elders and leaders. Um, hello everyone and welcome to our special Remembrance Day event at Moreton Bay. Um, Moreton Bay at War with Peter Dunn OAM. Peter is the webmaster of the very popular and comprehensive Australia at War site and an expert in military activities in Australia during World War II. And we're very lucky to have him here with us today online to talk about World War II in Moreton Bay. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Peter. I'll hand over. Thank you very much. Thanks, Helen. I'll start the share. So you should be able to see um, my PowerPoint and I'll now run it and you should see a full screen hopefully. Okay, so the title today uh, is Moreton Bay at War, um, military locations in the Moreton Bay region during World War II. And I'll talk about that photo uh, a little bit later. That's a photo that was found in the dump by a friend of mine. Uh, a little bit of background on myself. I'm a retired electrical engineer. I um, uh, used to work for Powerlink Queensland, retired back in September 2012. I've got a very large website called Australia at War with well over 6,000 web pages uh, about Australia during, the, during World War II. Typically, I get about 500 to 800 visitors a day to the website. Um, I haven't checked today, but at Remembrance Day, it would be up a fair bit. Uh, Anzac Day, I usually get close to 4,000 visitors. You'll see listed below there some of the topics um, that I cover on the website. I'm not going to uh, read through those, but I'll let you have a read while I have a quick snip of water. <clears throat> okay, I've also got a, um, a USB um, which I sell online, um, which has got a copy of my uh, website plus a self-help research file that I've put together. I think it's about 23 pages of links to various online resources that you can um, access by sitting at home at your desk. Uh, that's where I do all my research at home. I don't go to libraries and whatever. Sorry, Helen. Um, and also on that uh, USB is a copy of the seven eBooks that I've published. Um, I've also got a number of other research products that help support the running costs of my uh, my website. So there's the seven eBooks. Uh, the latest one was this one over here. There never was a Brisbane line. The most popular one is this one here, the Battle of the Coral Sea. Um, <clears throat> you can get them independent, buy them independently, or on the USB. There's some of the other things that I've got available on the website as well. Um, this is a talk I'm going to do again shortly. Um, Okay, let's get into it. Um, looks like everyone can hear me. Um, okay, and see everything. So start with Camp Strathpine. Um, so over here on the left, I've got a um, fairly detailed map. Uh, not sure how clearly you can see it on your screen, but there are, you'll also see that there are three airfields, one, two, and three. This is Spitfire Avenue here. Um, and I'll talk about the units that were based here on the next couple of slides, but you can see here, 3rd Infantry Regiment area, the 2nd Infantry Regiment area, 1st Infantry, Medical Battalion, uh, Division Headquarters area and Engineer Battalion. And then up here, there's an artillery, live firing artillery area. And there's a few buildings there that you can see. So in July 1943, 15,000 men of the American US Army 1st Cavalry Division uh, arrived in the Pine Rivers Shire and uh, overwhelmed the Shire, which at that time only had a population of 4,800 persons, people. Those men uh, completed their uh, amphibious training, you know, beach landings, etc., cetera, um, at Torbal, Torbal Point at the Combined Training Centre, which I'll talk about a little bit later. They were involved in live artillery firing range using that, the one they had at Clear Mountain uh, in the area. And people who live now in that area many years later often find uh, unexploded ordnance in their backyard or on their property. 
There were also two live practice hand grenade ranges, uh, one east of Four Mile Creek and another north of Wynn Road, and two live firing mortar ranges at Kashmir, one near One Mile Creek, uh, just south of Ira Buckby Road West, and the other on both sides of Wynn Road. Hope you don't live in that area. Uh, the 1st Cavalry Division uh, only stayed there for about five months and they left Camp Strathpine headed for New Guinea in December 1943. There's a photo with uh, General MacArthur uh, on the right here in the leather jacket visiting uh, Camp Strathpine and looks like he arrived in the General's two-star car, staff car, and he's got his four-star flag flying from that uh, staff car. This is pretty typical for American camps uh, around Australia when they were <clears throat> um, evacuated by the Americans, the Australian army would take over. Sometimes the British Navy towards the end of the war, occasionally the RAAF, but mostly the Australian army. So here's a photo of Camp Strathpine after the Yanks had moved out and here's all the unit signs for all the different Australian army units that were in camp at that particular point in time. I know my dad um, camped there for a while. He was in the 42nd Battalion. So the other two battalions of the 29th Infantry Brigade would have been there as well, I assume. Um, and I have information on 200, at least 283 units, Australian Army units, uh, that um, camped at Camp Strathpine over the fullness of time during World War II. Um, righto, so that's Camp Strathpine. The, I did mention the Combined Training School. Uh, I'll now talk about that in detail. It, initially, it started as an Australian Army um, sort of training camp, uh, training school for beach landings. Later became an American one and then swapped back to the Australian Army again. So the site for the Australian Army's Combined Training Centre, or CTC, near Sandstone Point at Torbal, was selected on the 16th of June. It was initially known as the First Australian Army Combined Training School. And it was set up to train the 7th Division troops in amphibious warfare. That's Australian Army 7th Division. The Royal Australian Navy had a naval wing that operated there. Um, so they operated all the landing craft, etc. And that, that was known as RAN Station 5, Combined Operations Training Centre, Naval Wing, uh, was part of that training school. The RAAF also provided two squadrons, number five squadron and number 32 squadron, to provide um, training to add realism uh, to the beach landing exercises that took part uh, in, on Bribey Island. This is a National Archives um, plan of the Australian Army uh, camp at uh, Torbal. I believe the bridge to Bribie probably goes from this little jut of land here over to Bribie Island. Um, this camp actually goes a fair bit further down the east coast here. Uh, so there are more buildings and tented areas, etc., down to the bottom right of the, of the screen here. So this was when it was an Australian, Royal Australian Engineers camp. Quite a busy place, as you can see. Um, the initial commanding officer and chief instructor there was Major Alfred Lionel Rose, not the boxer. Uh, there's a picture of him there. Um, his adjutant was Captain John Smith. Uh, he was also the quartermaster. And initially they had five um, instructors, Captain Miller and Mackenzie, and Lieutenants Kendall Crombie Jefferson, um, possibly the first two guys were replaced uh, later, a little bit later by Captain Austin and Captain Watson. The training initially there for the 7th Australian Division involved the 2nd 25th, 2nd 31st and 2nd 33rd Australian Infantry Battalions. And they commenced that training there on the 8th of August uh, 1942. So this is reasonably early in the war. Um, they made the beach landings as realistic as they possibly could. They had smoke uh, screens floating across the beach. They had real machine gun fire, real explosions in safe locations, obviously, but, but reasonably close to the men as they were landing. And there were um, aircraft uh, doing dive bombing attacks, um, uh, RAAF aircraft. 
approximately 25,000 Australian troops actually got trained there at Torbal Point from August 1942 to March 1943. So as you can see by those numbers, quite a very busy place and they even became busier as time went on. The Americans started to arrive at Torbal Point in early 1943 and uh, the Australian presence uh, started to become minimal, um, was reasonably minimal by mid-1943. When the Yanks did, they moved in, and but later on when they moved out, um, the barges and men of the Australian Army water transport units moved into this training school at Torbal Point. So I've got access to information that lets me um, work out where Australian Army units are at a certain location during the war. So I've got three pages here of units that were based at that location at Torbal Point during World War II. I'm not gonna read all these. So some of these would have been units that were being trained there in beach landings. Some of them would have been there supporting the camp and training the men uh, who were doing the beach landings. So that's the first page. I can see there's a tank battalion there as well. So they had tanks involved. That's the second page of units. And that's the third page of um, Australian Army units that were located at Torbal Point in that early period up to um, early to mid um, 1943, just before the Yanks arrived. Okay, so the Yanks. On the 8th of February 1943, uh, the 7th Amphibious Force of the US Navy under Rear Admiral Barbie located three officers and 60 enlisted men at Torbal Point in readiness um, for taking over the site. And they also had with them 10 36 foot landing craft personnel. In May 43, the Australian Army Training School was turned over to the commander of the 7th Amphibious Force. Um, Admiral Bar Rear Admiral Barbie. The site then became known as the 7th Amphibious Training Centre under Captain Cornelius Flynn. Um, Flynn lived in Congo House, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, at 36 Banya Street, Bongaree, on Bribey Island. It's about 500 metres southeast of the Bribey Island Library, where I gave a similar talk to this uh, a year or two ago. Um, Congo House was later occupied by Lieutenant Colonel Gus Gearman when the Australian Army Water Transport Group moved in. So when the Yank uh, officer moved out, the uh, senior Australian Army officer moved in. So there's an early photo of the house and it looks like it may have been raised at some stage and that house is still there. And it, it's used by, um, I've forgotten, forgotten. Um, yeah, I can't remember, by a comfort fund type organisation. Um, okay, the US Navy Amphibious Training Centre. Um, at the 1st of February 44, the size of that training school there had increased significantly to 28 officers and 495 enlisted men. And they had the following ships that you can see listed there. Um, LCPs, LCVs, LCMs, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, LCM is landing craft mechanised, as you can see in the photo, LCV is landing craft vehicle. The P means personnel, I think the L means large and the R means ramp. Okay, these are the US Army units, or the major ones at least, that trained at Torbal Point uh, after the Australians moved out. So there were three main divisions, the 24th Division uh, in October 1943, the 32nd Division in August 1943, and the 41st Infantry Division in January 1944, with all those subunits uh, in those divisions. That's a photo of a Higgins boat, which is another name for an LCVP, uh, about to land on the beach at Warham in about October 1943. So, I did some research on some of the war diaries of uh, some of the American units. So I found um, the war diary for USS landing ship tank 
459, so that's a fairly large landing ship, so it can take tanks. Um, so on a typical day, uh, this is the 16th of May, 1943, they left uh, Redcliffe Point, headed for Bribey Island at 06.30 hours in the morning. They arrived up there and completed their first beach exercise at uh, 10.46, just after quarter to 11 in the morning. They completed their second beach landing at just before midday. Uh, they then anchored off Bribey, probably to have lunch, I guess. Uh, and then they completed their third beach landing at 2.20 p.m. and their fourth one at three minutes past three in the afternoon. They then returned to Redcliffe Point at um, 15.30 hours and completed a further nine beachings the following day and three night beachings uh, on the 31st of May. So they were pretty busy lads and they would, have, would not have been the only landing ship tank. There would have been quite a lot of them there, plus other sorts of landing vehicles, landing ships, should I say, as well. There's a, um, a plaque stone type thing uh, to do with the amphibious training centre located at Oxley Place on Sandstone Point. I haven't seen that myself, but someone sent me that lovely photo of it. And it looks like that was unveiled in September 1995. So the, the US Navy uh, training centre closed by the 5th of February 1944, when the 41st Division uh, completed their training. And the site was then handed over to the Australian Army Water Transport Group, which I intimated earlier. It became known as the Water Transport Training Centre in April 1944, and later changed its name to the Land Headquarters School of Water Transport in June 1945. Okay, so that's Torbal Point. Um, I'm going to talk now about the guns that were located around Morton Bay, the coastal guns. So I'll start up the top. Uh, hopefully you can see my pointer. So the red star at the top is Bribey Battery, where there were two large six inch guns. The other two six inch guns were at Cowan Battery on the west side of um, Morton Island at Cowan Cowan. Um, the, um, other guns were one American 155 millimeter guns. There's uh, a battery that not many people know about called Emu Battery. It was a mobile battery uh, just near Wellsby's Lagoon on Bribey Island. There were two 155 millimeter guns. Skirmish Battery, which is that one that was on my first slide, um, which is not a mobile battery, but um, completely um, concreted in, if you like, in, in a large bunker type system. Uh, there were two 155 millimeter guns. Another bunkered concrete battery was uh, two 155 millimeter batteries at Rouse Battery on the east southeast coast of Morton Island. Uh, and Bandicoot Battery was a mobile site um, with two 155 millimeter guns up the top left. I think that's Combiuro Point from memory. I guess the other gun uh, of significance was a 4.7 inch Mark II gun here at Lytton Battery. Um, there were other smaller guns, I think, as well. So they're the guns. I'll talk a little bit more about some of those uh, on the coming slides. So Fort Cowan was built in the late 90s, so this is on the west coast of Morton Island. The two six inch guns covered the narrow entrances to Morton Bay and the examination anchorage. So ships had to come in, anchor, be examined by another vessel to make sure they were, they were friends and not foe. Uh, and then they'd be led on their way. They would have to fly a signal in the, uh, initially before they anchor at the anchor, examination anchorage. So the gun there was called an examination gun site. Pre-war the guns were manned by the 8th Heavy, heavy Battery. Uh, assisted by a militiamen of the 122nd Heavy Battery Royal Australian Artillery. In October 1940, the Coast Artillery was reorganised and regular army and militia merged to form what was known as Cowan Battery at Cowan on um, Morton Island. From December 1941, Cowan Battery was defended by infantry of the 13th Garrison Battalion the 7th Garrison Battalion and the 2nd 2nd Headquarters Guard Battalion. So these are like v VDC units. 
Cowan Battery. So these are the men who protected the gun with rifles and machine, light machine guns, etc., or medium machine guns in some cases. Cowan Battery ceased uh, keeping watches as the war progressed by August 1944, and by January 45, the guns were placed on care and maintenance basis. So there's a um, early photo of Cowan Battery being constructed. <clears throat> this is before they were totally enclosed by a large concrete structure. So there it is inside the concrete structure, uh, one of the guns. It's on the 13th of November, 1943 at Cowan Battery. You can see it's quite a crew there. It's two, five, seven, nine, ten, I can see in the photo. There's uh, a heavily camouflaged uh, one of the two guns uh, at Cowan Battery with uh, camouflage netting and trees and whatever. That's a camouflaged um, command tower. It's a concrete structure, but uh, I believe it's sitting on uh, timber poles raised up in the air to uh, get better view, a better view. That's, I believe that's a Cowan Battery. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it is. And I believe it's the battery plotting room. I've got those photos from David Nielsen. That's not concrete by the looks of it. That's um, sheeted, sheeted building. There's uh, a, a searchlight tower, which is raised. It's concrete and looks like it's sitting on timber poles. So that's a searchlight tower. If you look very closely, you can sort of just see the searchlight sitting in there. I don't know what that tower is, and I believe that's at Cowan Cowan, and that's the lighthouse, so according to David Jones, um, taken on the 26th of September, 1976. That was also taken by David, and I find it hard to believe that the gun's still there in September, 1976, but there's something there that looks like a gun poking out of one of the gun stations. Um, Someone else sent me some photos taken in 2005 of some of the structures as they slowly fell under the sea. There was an incident at Cowan Battery. Um, on the 4th of March, the HMAS Tamba, an auxiliary minesweeper, um, didn't display the right signal codes to be recognised as, as a friendly ship. And the battery uh, attempted to fire a practice round which was filled with plaster of Paris across the bow. They fired the round, but unfortunately it didn't go across the bow. It actually struck the ship below the gun station and able seaman Archibald Barch was hit and killed instantly. Uh, a steward, Mr. Harrison, was severely injured. The shell also severed both legs of Warrant Officer Thieman and Stoker Forward had severe cuts to his face. So severe, in fact, that um, by the time they got him to Pinken Bar, on the way to hospital, he actually died um, on the way to, before he got to Pinken Bar. So quite a tragic uh, mix up and tragic accident um, associated with Cowan Battery. Behind the battery, there were um, four ammunition magazines. This is one of the magazines. This is a photo taken by Richard Walding, whose website I can highly recommend. Um, he goes into a lot more detail on some of these uh, stations, particularly the Royal Australian Navy stations. He does cover the guns as well, but has some really good information on there. So that's a uh, former ammunition magazine about 50 metres behind gun number two, and that's now a holiday shack. And there are three others that I don't have photos of that, that are also now, or well, they were, um, and may still be holiday shacks. Um, on Cowan, there was a Australian Army surface radar uh, located on the higher ground. Um, if you look here, I've turned the plan around, so this writing here is upside down, but I've written, rewritten it here. So the radar, which is there, is about 4,500 feet from the lighthouse at Cowan Cowan on a bearing of 252 degrees. It was um, manned by the 9th Australian Radar Detachment initially, and then later the 14th Australian Radar Detachment. So they had a mess, orderly room, sleeping quarters, and a, a powerhouse type arrangement here, and, sh and showers and a toilet <laughs> to the left there. 
Now, the, unfortunately, uh, Sergeant Patrick Lawrence Lennox, who was in charge of the unit when he was there, I don't know which unit he was with, one of those two there, um, went for a swim in the water there uh, in front of their uh, radar site. And uh, unfortunately, he drowned on the 30th of September, 1944. Okay, bribey battery. Um, it's probably the most well known of the batteries, I guess. Uh, two six-inch guns were installed on temporary mounts in late 1939, so this is before the war in the Pacific, at what, at, at what was called at that point in time Fort Bribey. Uh, new mounts were built and became operational in early 1942, and the site became known as Bribey Battery, although a lot of people, and so do I sometimes, call it Fort, Fort Bribey. On in this, from December 1941, the guns were defended. Uh, so these are the, the ground personnel with rifles and machine guns defending the guns by the Brisbane, sorry, the Bribie Covering Force, which became part of 14 Garrison Battalion in March 1942. Later on, the 13 Garrison Battalions and 7th Garrison Battalion and 2nd 2nd Headquarters Guard Battalion provided close defences for the two guns at Bribie Battery. In mid-43, two platoons from E Company of 6th Volunteer Defence Corps Battalion from Caloundra started to do some training at Bribey Battery. And in January 44, they became known as Coast Artillery Brisbane uh, Volunteer Defence Corps. By August 44, Bribey Battery maintained watches on only one of the two guns and one of the searchlights, which was used as the examination battery, which I remember I talked about that earlier on. Uh, and with VDC, v, the, you know, Dad's Army type people, uh, remaining on part-time duty on the gun and the searchlight. Uh, headquarters Brisbane Coast Artillery uh, moved to Fort Bribey by August 44, but then moved back to Brisbane in January 45. You'll find Army units moved around quite a lot. In August 45, Bribey Battery closed down and the guns were dismantled. Uh, that's the battery observation post at Bribey Battery. That appears to be on steel, sitting on steel frame. Um, that's some of the shots taken quite a while ago of um, one of the batteries at Bribey Island, taken by Daniel Holkren. Um, a friend of mine was flying back from Caloundra uh, in July last year. And without me asking, knew that I was interested and took these photos out of his light aircraft of the two gun emplacements that um, are about to go missing into the ocean, unfortunately, um, because our government or council aren't doing the right thing. It's probably the government, I'd say. Um, here's a plan that I found on the National Archives website uh, showing the layout of Bribey Battery. Um, you can see, where are we? There's the two guns. There's number one gun just there. There's number two, two gun. And you can see light machine gun, medium machine gun, searchlight batteries, medium machine gun, etc. And there's stockades. There's a stockade there, stockade there, stockade there. And there's a mortar position here as well. So searchlights, etc. So that's the layout for Bribey Battery. Uh, which is fast disappearing. Skirmish battery has totally disappeared. Um, as you can see, it was quite a large concrete structure. Um, and as I said, these photos were provided by a friend of mine who found them in the rubbish tip. Uh, so this battery and, uh, had two 155 millimeter guns. That uh, was located at the southern end of Warham, covering the entrance to Brisbane. Uh, it was established in September 42 and initially used as a training location for the newly formed letter batteries, which were each equipped with two mobile 155 millimeter guns. So why they were called letter batteries, so there was A battery, B battery, C battery, D battery, E battery, etc. So that's why they were called the letter batteries. So D heavy battery uh, was formed on site at Skirmish and they developed and maintained the site until May 1943. Um, another photo. Um, e, F and L letter batteries were formed uh, at Skirmish Battery and after some training they headed up to Townsville in North Queensland. 
P Heavy Battery arrived in February 43 and trained nearby and took over the gun stations uh, in May 1943. From July 43 to November, P Heavy Battery also looked after Rouse Battery on Morton Island. During uh, 1944, skirmish battery duties reduced until it was dismantled in September 1944. So here's a bit of a layout that I've drawn up using uh, uh, an aerial from um, Google Earth. Um, so the, um, that's, where are we? There's number one gun position in between 4th Af Avenue and 3rd Avenue. Number two gun position just slightly north of 4th Avenue a battery command post, coast artillery searchlight down the bottom here, another one up there, um, a battery um, post, oh, I've forgotten its name, a water tank, and up further here to the north at Warham on the beach, which we'll talk about shortly, was a totally separate Royal Australian Navy station, RAN4, which I'll explain in, in a little bit of time. So again, um, I've got some um, pages here, I think it's three pages of Australian Army units that were based on Bribie Island during World War II. Not all necessarily at that, those, that gun, those two gun stations. Uh, some of them would have been at the gun stations, but they were also at other locations. So that's the first um, page of units. There's the second page of um, Australian Army units. So field hygiene section. And there's the last page, some transport companies. So there must have been some sort of a transport depot somewhere on uh, Bribe there as on yeah, Bribe Island as well during the war, which is interesting. Um, okay, Rouse Battery. So this is that one uh, on that map that I showed you at the southeast uh, side of Morton Island. That was established uh, in March 1943. There were two 155 millimeter guns, which were operated by O Heavy Battery as a coast uh, uh, coastal training location. When O Heavy Battery moved out in July 43. A skeleton crew from P Heavy Battery manned the guns until S Heavy Battery arrived in November 43. Uh, S Heavy Battery handed over the guns to a caretaker party from Cowan Battery in January 1944. And the part-time soldiers of A Company 6 Volunteer Defence Corps Battalion uh, in April 1944 joined up with Coast Artillery Brisbane VDC and train, trained, should I say, to man the guns on a call-out basis. So they weren't manned 24 hours a day. They were on a, on a call-out basis. They didn't have pages in those days. Um, they trained at Rouse Battery until September 44, when the site was eventually closed down. So there's uh, one of the guns, the 155 millimeter mobile gun, being positioned onto the, um, the pad where they uh, sort of bolted it onto the centre here and then it could rotate around uh, its arc of fire um, when it was in service and you can see the tractor there pushing it into place. For those who have been to the forts at Townsville on, uh, just off Magne on Magnetic Island just off Townsville, same, uh, same sort of setup as what you see here, uh, circular plinth uh, with these sort of guns, two 155 millimetre guns. There's some old um, uh, photos, sorry, photos of old uh, the gun stations sent to me by Mark Watts. Um, some more photos from Mark. Okay, there was also an incident with Rouse Battery. Uh, ships going through the South Passage, uh, you know, between Morton and North Stradbroke uh, were required to give a coded uh, signal after a challenge from Rouse Battery. One day the uh, motor vessel Tangaluma did not respond with the appropriate uh, response from the challenge and it passed within 200 metres of Rouse Battery's protective uh, infantry. The guys with the small, small arms weapons and machine guns and because uh, they thought it might not have been a friend but a foe they opened fire on uh, MV Tangaluma. 
Fortunately, Dr. Ewa, Ewa, uh, Noel Ewa, who was um, part of the um, Rouse Battery, recognised the boat and the troops were ordered to cease fire. And luckily, nobody, nobody was injured in that particular incident, unlike the other one with HMAS Tambo. So Bandicoot Battery was that um, mobile battery that I talked about at the northeast, northwest sorry, tip of Morton Island at Combiuro Point. It was established as a training location on the 17th of April, 1943, and the guns were operated uh, initially by M Heavy Battery. They arrived there on the 19th of April, 1943. <clears throat> um, it didn't stay in service very long, um, obviously just a short-term training location, and it um, was closed down in July 1943 when M Heavy Battery moved to New Guinea. So not as many Australian Army units um, were located on Morton Island during World War II, probably not quite as accessible, but for whatever reason, strategic reasons, um, there weren't quite as many. Um, I guess I should have put this on two pages, but there's certainly not three pages. There's two columns um, of Australian Army units that were based on Morton Island during World War II. And if anyone wants to contact me any later on about any of those units that I've shown, I can provide you with a lot more information on those units as well, if you're interested. Um, so the other uh, not that well-known battery was Emu Battery. Uh, again, a mobile battery, similar to Bandicoot. It was also a training location just, just north of Wellsby Lagoon for the locals on Bribey Island. Sort of not quite halfway between Bribey Battery and uh, Skirmish Battery. It had two mobile 155 millimeter guns uh, operated by N Heavy Battery and it closed down also in July 1943, when N Heavy Battery moved to New Guinea. So both of those temporary sites were obviously training locations. So now I'm going to talk about um, Royal Australian Navy um, sites that were located around Moreton Bay during World War II. So this is a little bit more complicated. Hopefully you'll see uh, where I am because I've got yellow circles. So we'll start up the top here. Um, this was the Port War Signalling Station at Caloundra. It actually initially was located um, down here at Cowan Cowan on, um, on Morton Island, but relocated very early in the piece to Caloundra. So it was RAN Station 1. RAN Station 2 was a controlled mining and guard loop station, initially here at Bribey Island, but then moved to Tangaluma on Morton Island, on the west coast of Morton Island. So they had um, mines that they could operate and, and, and loops in the ocean bed to detect submerged vessels. RAN Station 3 um, was just a bit north of that up RAN 2, and that was a controlled mining and guard loop station at Cowan Cowan, which I'll talk about a bit more shortly. RAN Station 4, which will probably be very familiar with the people on Bribey Island, um, was the Indicator Loop and Harbour, Harbour Defence ASDIC. So they had listening devices. So these circular things, and there was one from the station as well. Um, and a big bunker on the beach and two smaller um, generator type bunkers um, behind it. Um, so that's at Warham. RAN Station 5 we talked about was the Amphibious Training School or Combined Training Centre. Um, that was the Naval Wing, which was known as RAN Station 5 at Sandstone Point. RAN Station 6 was more or less, I am, uh, as I understand it, um, located in front of the Bribey Island Library. So that was the Advanced Fair Mile Base or AFMB at Mongaree. Uh, during World War II, and I'll show you one of the female ships a bit later. RAN Station 7 at um, <clears throat> Combiuro Point on Morton Island was the other end of the loops, the four loop sections that went across um, the, ma the main entrance into Morton Bay. Um, if you look, there's a, 
if you, you know, ever been on holidays up the Sunshine Coast, you'll see the ships come in very close and then they pass down this because there's a channel, the main channel, and they pass down here. Then there's three options here. Uh, I believe this is the normal one, but there are, or maybe it's this one, but there are three channels, Pearl Channel, Main Channel, and East Channel. And each of those channels were on, had mines on, on um, buttons um, or controlled mines on those channels. And there were controlled mines up here. Um, RAN Station 8 was a boom defence facility at Lytton, um, between Lytton, sorry, and Bulwa Island. I'm not going to talk about that much later, but that was effectively a ship which was called HMAS Kinchula, which was anchored uh, in line, uh, parallel to the shore, uh, sort of in the middle of the river, more or less, uh, with a fixed net on one side and an op a net that could open or close on the other side. So they would challenge vessels coming up the river, and if they believed they were friendly vessels, they would open the open the uh, the you know the moving net and let them through. RAN Station Nine uh, was in a little park uh, nearby, um, where there was an indicator loop station and a and an infrared beam uh, that flashed across to um, to Fisherman's Island. Um, so that was also more uh, two methods of detecting uh, vessels coming up the river so that they could be challenged. Um, indicator loops, which are loops in the bed of the river, um, which would detect a submerged submarine going across them due to the magnetic change in magnetic field. And sim in simple terms, they had a magnetometer connected in, uh, at the end of the loop that was set in the bed of the river and if something submerged went over that loop the magnetometer would flicker um, and if it was at night time the infrared beam would get broken and they would know there was a vessel coming up the river in darkness the other royal australian navy station sort of more or less in moreton bay if you like uh, was ran 10 which was sort of home base for the controlled mining um, uh, establishment and it was located at Pinkin Bar. That was their depot. So a little bit about RAN Station 2. Um, it was initially at Bribey, so it was a controlled mining and guard loop station. Uh, they had two mine control huts there uh, at Bribey, near num just north of Number 2 Gun. Uh, then they relocated to Tangaluna on the 13th of September 1943, where they also had two underground concrete rooms a controlled mining hut and a generator room. And they had the following facilities there, uh, officers' quarters and mess, ratings, rec room, et cetera, et cetera, and water tank. Um, RAN station three uh, was at Cowan Cowan. And they that was a second controlled mining and guard loop station on Morton Island. It was located at the southern end of Cowan Battery and was responsible for two controlled minefields. Remember I showed you the two channels, Pearl Channel and the main channel. So they controlled uh, M11 uh, minefield and M5 minefield. Overall in the bay, I've only shown you a simplified view of what happened. Uh, Richard Walding's website will give you very much more detail. Overall, there were 16 mine loops in the bay and six guard channel, guard loops, should I say, uh, between Morton Island and Bribey Island. And they were laid by the Royal Navy, a uh, ship called HMS Atreus from starting on the 27th of June, 1942. Here's a plan I found on um, the National Archives website of RAN Station 3 and Cowan Battery. It must be an early plan because it actually doesn't show the guns. Um, but I've spun it around a bit because you can see Morton Bay is upside down. Um, and you can see four magazines here, um, some northern quarters, an engine room, a searchlight there, another searchlight here. And that's where the initial signal station was for the Port War Signaling Station, which I mentioned relocated early in the piece to Caloundra. 
That's um, a 1958 aerial view of Cowan, and you can make out the magazines here and some of the other buildings, etc. There's something happening here and something here, and there's a shadow of something there. Uh, a bit hard to see. So RAN Station 4. So we're now on, at Warham on Bribey Island, and many of you would probably know this particular building. Th these are photos that I took uh, quite a long time ago. And if you look to the right here, you can see the loop cables uh, sitting on top of the sand uh, to the right um, of, the, um, of, the, of this bunker for RAN Station 4. So this is the indi indicator loop up, loot, <laughs> loop hut. Uh, there, those are the two other bunkers. One you can see quite readily in the park behind that larger bunker. And that other bunker, when I took these photos, I had to climb through some reasonably rugged bush to take that photo of that um, generator bunker. And these are those um, indicator loops that I photographed next to that bunker. So they're you know, like yay round, um, if you can see that. Um, and with multi-core cables. So as I said, they form a loop and come back into the hut and connect to a more or less a galvanometer. <clears throat> which they use to detect um, submerged vessels uh, entering Moreton Bay. So, righto, let's move on. So RAN Station 5 is now that naval wing, which was located at the combined um, training centre um, at Torbal on Bribey Island. Um, that uh, they commenced, the naval wing itself commenced to operate at um, Stanstone Point on the 5th of August, 42, uh, when two officers and 11 naval ratings arrived. And also they were assisted by some members of the Naval Auxiliary Patrol, which are sort of volunteer type people assisting the Navy. Prior to arrival of, the, of their landing, their regular landing craft, they were provided with 30 folding boats, as you can see down the bottom here, for training purposes. That increased, that number of boats later increased to 100 boats. So you can see it folded down the bottom here and then unfolded, fully erected, if you like. The Navy also provided whatever boats they could source and commandeer locally um, from the local fishermen, etc. And um, these folding boats you can see here carried a maximum of 24 fully equipped men. And they were told, towed, sorry, by the Naval Auxiliary Patrol vessels. As I said, many of them were commandeered. Uh, Tonga, Summit, Marion, Oha, Omaha, Little John, Rural and Nita were some of them. Little John was owned by Sir John Chandler, who later became Mayor of Brisbane. He was also, I think, my dad's commanding officer during the war, I believe. Um, and here's a photo that I was sent of Little John about two or three months ago, uh, just after the fellow had bought Little John and about two or three days before it sank in, in Breakfast Creek. And I believe it's still sitting in Breakfast Creek in the mud. And unfortunately, uh, all attempts have been unsuccessful in raising that ship. Um, Right. So I told you I'd show you a photo of a fair mile vessel. So there's one there down the bottom. So they operated in front of the uh, Bribey Island Library at Mongaree. So that was known as RAN Station 6, Advanced Fair Mile Base. So they were very small but very fast wooden hulled vessels. About 112 foot long with a top speed of 20 knots. RAN Station 7 at Combiuro Point um, was the indicator loop and harbour defence ASDIC station. So that was that other end of that four uh, loops that went across to, to Wurram. Uh, and there's a couple of photos taken uh, by Richard Balding. Uh, again, I highly recommend his website. Um, people sometimes ask me, did the Japanese actually mine um, off Brisbane? And the answer is yes, uh, to most people's shock. On the 13th of March, uh, Japanese submarine I-6 uh, in 1943 
laid nine acoustic German mines within six miles of Point Cart Cartwright Headland at the Sunshine Coast near Malula Bar, um, slightly south and northeast of Caloundra. They would have been near the channel, near or in the channel. Uh, the mines were discovered by accident by HMAS Swan on the 24th of March, so not too long later, uh, 11 days later, um, when two mines self-detonated, when HMAS Swan and some other ships were doing live firing uh, with their large guns in, in the area, and the percussion and noise set off these acoustic mines accidentally. Uh, so that um, all hell broke loose and a, a minesweeper, HMAS Gimpy, was um, dispatched to the area and it went on to find w one other mine, uh, which it also, which it destroyed to clear the entrance to Port, Port of Brisbane. So that was the main entrance to the Port of Brisbane. The other interesting information uh, is that Australia was um, a very large storage area for chemical weapons during World War II. There were many, um, many thousands, many tons stored at Inala during World War II, um, north of Townsville, Charters Towers, west, uh, out Chinchilla Way, uh, Sydney, and various other locations in Australia. And that was all stored just in case the Japanese used chemical weapons. So that was mustard gas, lewisite, etc. When the war ended, uh, all the stuff at um, Inala was all stuck on ships and it was all dumped in two locations off Moreton Bay. Um, so there was 8,000 tonnes of chemical weapons agents and all sorts of other stuff uh, dumped uh, in those locations and other, and other guns and ammunition dumped in other, lo other locations. If anyone wants the GPS coordinates, I can send you a spreadsheet. Do you no good? They're miles too deep. Um, Okay, let's swap to the RAAF for a while. Um, this is an actual photo of one of the two radar towers located at Torbal. So this photo was taken from the top of the other tower um, at Torbal. Now, a lot of the locals don't even know this was there and that actually some of the bunkers are still there. Um, I'm not gonna tell you the exact location because they're fairly well looked after but they are near Palmerstone Road. Um, there's um, the two bunkers, I'll call them bunkers, um, igloo shaped bunkers, uh, where the radar equipment was housed. And you can see just to the right here, one of the four legs um, for one of those two large towers and the other large tower was up here behind the, beside that other, other um, igloo bunker, which is, and you can see its legs in this photo down here, you can see three of the legs. The other one is probably hidden by a tree, small tree. I took this photo a number of years ago. So these uh, two bunkers are in reasonably good condition. And there are two smaller bunkers um, sort of behind, as I took the photo behind me, across the other side of a small road in the bush. And this is, um, so those two bunkers were over here to the east. This is the road, Pummerstone Road is up the top here, running left to right. And this is the camp for that radar camp. And there are two small bunkers left behind, one here, which was a generator bunker and another generator bunker just here. They're sort of much smaller versions of those two larger bunkers that you saw. Okay, RAF airfields. Um, they're also used by the Americans as well. So I showed you um, this picture, part of this picture earlier on. So there was A1 at Petrie, A2 at Lawton, and A3 at Strathpine. So you can clearly see A2 Lawton because it was a, um, a paved strip during World War II and later became uh, the street called Spitfire Avenue. Can you see A1 Petrie? You don't have to answer, but can you see it? Can you see it? There it is. Now that you know where it is, if I take it off, you probably know that where it, you can probably recognize where it was. Um, so that was um, A1. So that's a 1949 aerial photo 
So it was a A1 was a grass strip. Can you see A3 Strathpine? It's down towards the bottom. Once you know where it is, you can sort of make out where it is. So that was A3 strip um, near South Pine Road, uh, to the right of South Pine Road and below Gympie Road. So this is this is all Strathpine, just up here, shopping centre. So the Americans also use um, some of these strips. The 80th Fighter Squadron of the 8th Fighter Group, United States Army Air Force, used A1 Petrie Airfield from the 10th of May uh, 42 to the 20th of July 42 for training before they moved north. Unfortunately, they had a number of fatal air crashes. Um, I'm not going to read the details there, but four gentlemen lost their lives uh, in those four different air crashes. Um, at the time, they were they had P400 uh, Aerocobras, not the P39 Aerocobra, but the P400 version of the Aerocobras. So one of them um, hit a tree at uh, Petrie Airfield, another one uh, collided with another one at um, near Redcliffe and went into the bay. Uh, another one was too close to the water and hit the water in Morton Bay. Whoops, go back. A and the last one, crashed into the sea in front of um, RAF station. Um, that's my phone ringing. I'll just ignore it. Um, in front of Sandgate. I think that might have been the guy who committed suicide. Um, the RAAF also used these airfields. Um, 83 Squadron um, formed at A3 Strathpine on the 26th of February, 1943. Uh, they were initially equipped with uh, six uh, P-39 Aerocobras. Um, they stayed at A3 and most of their missions, uh, however, were flown out of A1 Petrie Airfield. So they were flying um, anti-submarine missions because there were Japanese submarines operating off the coast, all the way down the east coast of Australia, in fact. Um, the 83 Squadron received their boomerang aircraft in June 43, um, and they were, their P-39 Aerocobras were withdrawn in September 1943. Um, they moved to uh, the Northern Territory in late December 1943, early January 44. 12 Squadron RAAF arrived at Strathpine in July 44 with Volte Vengeance dive bomber aircraft. Um, they've got a sort of gull-shaped wing where they prepared to convert to a heavy bomber squadron uh, to liberators. They eventually moved to Cecil Plains Airfield in December 44, where they were re-equipped with their B-24 liberators. The Royal Air Force, so the British Air Force, also operated from these three airfields. So they were well used during World War II. So 548 Squadron RAF was formed uh, actually established at Morton Airfield on the 15th of December, 43. Initially, they trained in Wirraways and Tiger Moss. They relocated to Petrie on the 19th of January, 44, and their Spitfires arrived at Petrie in April, 1944. Two of their pilots, um, unfortunately, had a collision uh, in that area, and there's a um, ceremony held every year in their memory. Uh, roughly near where one of them crash landed, uh, and they collided uh, not far from Petrie Airfield. So that squadron relocated to Ambly Airfield on the 25th of May, uh, 1944. So there's a photo of the whole squadron um, at uh, A1 Petrie Airfield. I don't have a date for that, but um, nice big tree, very big tree. Um, Another squadron, 549 Squadron, RAF, also formed at uh, Lawton Airfield on the 15th of December. They moved to Petrie on the 1st of January and their new Spitfires arrived in the same month, April 44, and they also relocated to Ambly on the 24th of May, 1944. Righto, let's go back to some spy activity in the, in the area. So <clears throat> a unit called Secret Intelligence Australia had their training headquarters at Caboolture at a place known then as Newman House. So there's the house, very large, salubrious sort of property. That house is gone now, and that is now Fernhill 
residential aged care for those who know the area. But that was a, a bed of spies uh, during World War II. SIA uh, was actually Section B of MacArthur's Allied Intelligence Bureau. And its commanding officer was Captain, he was a Royal Navy Captain, Roy Kendall. He actually, even though he was part of MacArthur's uh, network, he actually reported directly to MI6, to the head of MI6 in London, and he had direct access to Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Um, so we had MI6 guys. There were other MI6 guys as well, by the way. They had a spy in MacArthur's headquarters and there were, there were other units as well. Um, MacArthur sort of knew about this SIA because it was one of his units, but he also knew that it had a, a connection to MI6. He was reasonably happy for it to operate as long as their spying missions to enemy uh, head, uh, territory happened outside of MacArthur's Southwest Pacific area, which, which, which they did. So SIA headquarters itself were actually located at a new farm in an old house called Craig Royston at Bowen Terrace. Kendall lived nearby in a house called Amity on the Brisbane River. And in front of Amity was this little, what, he, what his son told me they called a cabana. Now that's not Amity, Amity's off, off the screen to the right here, and this is in front of Amity. But they had two spy boats that would leave from there to pick up the spies and take them up to uh, Borneo and the, and the other islands up that way where they, where they operated. And Amity was also, and his house obviously, was also located just slightly upstream of the US submarine base at New Farm and they would use the US submarines quite a lot to deploy their spies into enemy territory. So their training center and their radio wireless transmitters and receivers were located at Kabulcha in Moreton Bay Shire. Um, <clears throat> and they had large um, rhombic antennas in the paddocks behind the house. Their commanding officer was Major Gustavus Sears, a British Army officer. And as I said, they led intelligence operations behind enemy lines. Okay, nearly finished, and it is running a little bit late. You may have heard of the SS Rufus King. It was um, a ship that ran a ground, tried to um, enter Brisbane port by coming uh, south of Morton Island and north of Stradbroke Island in the South Passage, which he really wasn't supposed to do. And he ran aground um, on the 7th of July, 1942. And as you can see in this photo, the ship broke in half. Uh, it had um, a, a hospital on it that was coming to Australia and a lot of supplies including nine fully crated B-25 Mitchell bombers. And there's a photo of um, one of the bombers being recovered from the Rufus King. <clears throat> that half, I think it's that half of the Rufus King uh, were, remained afloat and they sealed it off and turned it into a floating workshop, which they towed up to New Guinea. It became known as the Half Rufus, because um, it was only half the ship. Okay, a couple more slides. Um, boom Defence, South Passage Bar. <clears throat> I was originally told by some experts that, that there never was a submarine boom defence between Morton and uh, the northern tip of North Stradbroke. However, I did some research, being undaunted, and. I found in an Admiralty War Diary dated the 10th of June 42, a fixed obstruction is also to be placed in the southern channel between Morton Island and Stradbroke Island. And then I found in Trove a newspaper article indicating uh, dated 20th of May 53, <coughs> that the ship miner, um, a mine layer, was laying a midget submarine net across South Passage. And then I found um, a naval survey sketch dated September 43, showing that a boom defence was under construction <coughs> between the two islands. 
So there's the minor. Um, and there's the, um, that um, naval survey. A um, little bit hard to make out what, what's what, but that's the outline of the southern tip of um, Morton Island. And that's the outline of the northern tip of Stradbroke. And there's the boom defence going across. And then a tip goes to there. So it starts at a jetty at Sandy Point and ends at a jetty that probably both don't exist anymore at Stradbroke Island. And over here, you can see the wreck of the Rufus King. <clears throat> and if I blow that up a little bit closer, you can see you know, the jetty, the two jetties that I talked about and the boom defence under construction. <coughs> they didn't finish it. <coughs> they drove 290 piles. They may have used some floats and concrete anchors, similar to these floats that were used in Darwin. The piles were driven to form dolphins. The dolphin is like three or four piles coming up to a point which they would suspend the nets between. But the project was called off uh, on the 30th of June, 1944. <coughs> <coughs> That's the end of my talk. Thank God for that, because I'm losing my voice. Uh, so uh, I'll hand back to Helen. Helen, you want to unmute yourself? You need to unmute yourself, Helen. Still can't hear you. Uh, I don't know why you're unmuted. Why? Did you unplug your microphone or anything? No. Can't hear you, Helen. Can, can anyone else hear you, Helen? Put your hand up if you can. Is that you now, Helen? No. Okay, um, while well, Helen's trying to get that going, I'm not quite sure why. Maybe if you go to the uh, little arrow beside the microphone, Helen, and just see what microphone you got selected. Has anyone got a question? Um, you can unmute yourself if you like uh, and ask the question. If everyone else could stay muted, that'd be good. Yeah, that was um, very interesting. Thank you. I very much enjoyed that. It's Stuart here. Hey, Stuart. <clears throat> yeah, Stuart. Yeah. Oh, just um, um, a couple of things. Um, you talk about those guns on um, Morton at Cowan. I, I actually remember playing on one of those in the 1970s. Right mid to late 1970s and I think it was the southernmost one mm -hmm. but I don't actually recall that it actually had a roof over the um, over it um, mm -hmm. but it was definitely a cow and it was a big thing too huge okay right. okay yeah. didn't take any photos eh <clears throat> no a bit young back then <laughs> but um, yeah didn't have, didn't have an iPhone then <laughs> no no, no but, uh, yeah it's a very interesting history uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, I'm I'm just sort of skimming over the top of it all here, um, showing showing you the highlights. So um, you can find more on my website, but I, I, again, I'd highly recommend Richard Balding's. Uh, website. Is that the Indicator Lips website? Is that his? Yeah, that's him, mate. Yeah, it's an okay. excellent site. He's got so much more yeah. detailed research because I cover with my website the whole of Australia. So I right. don't specialise in a particular location but I try to cover as much as I can. Yeah, um, as a matter of interest, was, was there ever an indicator loop at Laguna Bay at Noosa, from Noosa Heads across to... to I've, not, <clears throat> I've not heard of one, no. Okay. There was a, uh, in the, in the, again, back in the 1970s, I used to surf a lot and up around one of the headlands, there was actually a, a metal cabinet down on the, one of the rocky, uh, um, with a, a channel, 
concrete covered over it going into the it's very yeah. old right yeah so i don't know whether it was or not yeah no i don't think so mm. uh, it would have I... it would have been the navy who would have done it um <clears throat> if it was and they have no re they haven't published any records of it no anyway well thank you very much i very much appreciate that thank, thank you yeah. any other questions yeah Alison has yeah. one. Okay. I'm just wondering, is there anything left up at Caloundra of the RAN number one base, Peter? And this is that fantastic headland with all the memorials on it. Yeah. I, and I just wonder if there's anything down sort of at sea level or even up, up on that hill. Um, I haven't researched that. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure, to be quite honest. Okay. Um, something <clears throat> for me to look up then. Yeah, why don't I just... Have a look on my website. Um, what I've got, I've got over six thousand web pages, so I tend to forget okay. what I've got sometimes. <laughs> um, where will I have a look? <clears throat> I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll paste into the chat area um, my web page for that site. The, okay. So that's the Port War Signalling Station. Mm -hmm at um, Caloundra. So I've got a plan there of um, things. Um, I'm not sure whether I've sort of worked out exactly where it used to be uh, on, by being there physically. I've got a nice photo that um, David Jones gave me of the, um, the bunker type building. Um, mm -hmm. You'll see on that side if you visit it now. Um, quite, a, quite a nice photo actually. Um, Probably should have used it in my talk, actually. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very much, Peter. It's been a really interesting talk. Thank you. I appreciate mm. everything you've been able to tell us. Thank you. Helen, are you back online yet Hi. or not? No, she's not. Hi, okay, Hi Peter. Hi, Peter. Peter. I used to, strip, I used to um, holiday at Edmonton Point when I was a child, like from, you know, a few months old to, you know, when I was 16 or so, and I could see the Rufus King still out there it was amazing oh, yeah. okay yeah was is there more information about um activities on strabrook island itself um well i've got more detail on the units that were there right um, yeah the the little museum on strabrook island they do have in, some information yeah. and right. they do have some photos as well um yeah so that would be worth visiting um yeah i don't know whether it's still open in COVID times but I remember, it is. It I is. remember seeing some good information there myself last right. time I visited. Yeah. Peter, it's Donnell here. I grew up at Wellington Point and there were US troops stationed there. Yeah. Um, do you have any information on that? Yeah, that was, um, the, well, there were US and there may have been some Australian troops, the water transport guys as well, but there was a um, anti-aircraft gun training station at Wellington Point. Uh, run by the US Marine. I'm not sure who it was actually. Russell might know. But, um, they um, they would they had some aircraft um, based at Archfield Airfield, and they would tow a target out in front of Wellington Point, and the guys being trained on the anti-aircraft guns uh, would open fire, and hopefully not mm. hopefully not hit the aircraft. They also dropped them by parachute from aircraft, yes, and then yes. took aim at, at them. And King Island was a target too. And the women used to row out and get the yeah. parachutes because they were silk. Yeah. 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 I think I'm back, Peter. Yeah, yeah, I just noticed, <laughs> noticed it. you seem to be online. Thanks, I, I left and came on. I see Edo has a question, I think. Maybe. Oh, there's a little hand there. Edo. Yeah, he's got his hand up. Edo, E D D O. Do you want to ask a question? You need to unmute yourself. I, I would, but they still do. No. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Pull the data and then look at what. I'm sorry, I lost the list of questions when I had to log out and log back in. But I hope everyone had their questions answered. Someone, oh, Jack? Said, someone said here, just wondering where the guns that are currently located at the Little Ship Club at Dunwich 
came from. I don't know if that's the place that I went to from memory. I saw a 40 millimeter Bofors gun there. That was a, that's a very small anti-aircraft gun. It wouldn't have been one of these guns that I talked about today. Jack, did you have a question? Oh, I can't hear. Let's see. Jack doesn't appear to have a microphone. No, you don't see it. It's only coming up with video. Did you want to type your question in the chat? Here's Edo online. Can... Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear yes. you. Yes, we can hear you. Just very familiar with the guns and how um, I was originally as a kid was told they came off the HMA in Sydney. Yeah. Um, both of them. The first, first gun was removed, I believe, I was told by my father in the um, after the war in the early 50s. But the second one didn't wasn't removed until the, the early 80s. And yeah, that's, it went, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it went down to the Maritime Museum in on just opposite the city there near South Bank. It was sitting on the oh, okay. uh, foreshore there for a long time. But my question is, um, none of the staff there know what happened to it. You don't know um, where it where it disappeared to from there, or it was a it was a big uh, six inch gun. I've got a, there. I've got a contact in there. You know, the historian at the Maritime Museum, which yeah. is under threat of closing, by the way, at the moment. When did you? I realise that. That's why I'm bringing the question up right now because I've been when trying to track it down for a while. When did you say the gun left the island? 1980. Early uh, in the 80s, what happened was the we were very concerned that the erosion um, Jesus was going. So the a mob of engineers, I believe, came from Inogra and removed it. And it was donated, it was given, it was taken to the Maritime Museum. For many, many, many years, it was sitting right up near their dry dock on the riverbank. Right. Okay. But it's, it's disappeared 10, 20 years ago. I don't know where it's gone. I'll ask my friend. Who's got all the background noise? Is that you, Helen? No. Yep. <laughs> Just the other question is, there's a six-inch gun down in the War Memorial in Canberra. Uh, are you familiar if that came from this area or not? It was off the city as well. I know the gun, but I, I really don't know where it came from, no. Yeah, because it was a very similar, very, very similar, yeah. Okay, no worries, thanks for that. And very well, Edo, well, if you uh, want to email me, you'll find my email yep. on, on my web page. Yes. Uh, or I'll post it just here, if you like, as long as you don't publish it. Uh, com. What's that or? Yeah, so was at war at gmail.com. Okay. Send me an email so we make contact and then I'll find out from my friend at the Maritime Museum uh, what whether he knows about the gun. No worries. Thanks for that. Um, Rodman wants to ask another question. Hi. Um, do you have information too on the Centra? I don't know if that's the how you say it. Centaur. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, um, yeah I, I've got a web page on that. Um, if you like, I'll uh, I'll just find that now, if I can. Here we go. There it is, and I'll just grab that link, copy, and I'll paste that into the chat. And there you go. Uh, yeah, should be there now, in the chat area. You got it? Yep. So um, yeah, so they found that a few years ago, David Meehan, so I was giving him a little bit of hand there at one stage with a few bits and pieces of information before he found it. I don't think he used my info to find it though, but uh, it was interesting to be in touch with him. Any other questions, anyone? Alex? No? Uh, Jack has a question. Um, as a child, um, circa 1963, pre-bridge, I got to Bribe on a landing barge. Would this have been an ex-World War II craft? I'd say it would have been, uh, Jack. I'd say for sure. Yeah, I've, I have heard stories of some of them being you know, found in the bush in that area. So, uh, and I'm sure, um, I know a lot was sold um, <clears throat> from Combsley. Uh, after the war, I've got an aerial photo showing uh, 30, or, 30 to 100 of the damn things lined up along the 
the bank at Kamesley uh, ready for disposal. So, um, yep, I'd say it would be, would have been. Alex, did you have a question? No. Cassandra's left a, a lovely comment for you, Peter. Peter, interesting to talk. Read it in the chat. <laughs> used to four drive. As kids, we love exploring these arts and world. Okay. Thank you very much, Cassandra. Thank you. Interesting information. Thank you. Uh, so, Peter, Alex here. Um, can I just ask all, all the lovely maps and so on that you got from the National Archives, you got them straight off the website or did you go into the National Archives here in Brisbane? No, um, no, as I said, I sit at home and so they're all available on the National Archives okay. website. So my uncle was in the RAP and all I can get from his record is that he was at the number three training school, I think at Sandgate. Have you got any idea where that might have been? Yeah, the, the Eventide Retirement Village. Ah, okay. Okay, that was a RAF um, training camp. My father-in-law went through there as well. Again, if, if you just grab my email. Yep. Uh, send me an email. Give me your father's full name. And if you know his Lovely. service number, Fantastic. let me know and I'll see what I can find for you. That's very kind. Thank and, you, and Peter. Tell, and tell me, you know, the, was it, oh, I can't remember what, was it an S? Uh, wouldn't have been an SFTS. I can't remember. Anyway, just send me that info and I'll uh, chase it up for you. <clears throat> a great presentation. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. And as I meant to say before I couldn't speak, uh, thank you so much, Peter. That was really great. Um, we really appreciate you coming, spending the time today to come and talk to us. Thank um, you. Does anyone have any more questions? Uh, Bronwyn? Um, I had a relative who was in the American Army, but that's about all I know. Does anyone know how I'd go about finding information on him? Is he a relative who left a baby behind? Oh, he did marry a um, Australian girl in the end, and he came back and lived oh, okay. in Australia. <clears throat> yeah. One of <laughs> the one of, um, <clears throat> one of the very common emails that I get from my website because my email address is on over six thousand web pages. I get a lot of emails from people saying, hey, can you help me find my father? Oh, yeah. He was an American <laughs> soldier in Australia during World War II. And yep. then I ask him, well, what was his name? Don't know. What do you <laughs> Don't know. Where was he based? Don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. You got a photo? No. No. Really no much. Oh, okay. Can't help. <laughs> he, he was but one of the good guys. He if, actually if came his, back and married. If you know his name, there may be mm. some info you, I can find for you, perhaps. Okay. Yeah. Is um, Alan Cunningham? Yeah, well, if you email me, it's the best way. Oh, right. Yep. Uh, just email me, and if you even even if you know his unit, um, I do no, have. I don't know that. I do have a lot of unit history records as well. Right. <laughs> thank you so much for today. That was awesome. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Yes, um, Paul H says till mid eighty three, group wolf poles was still to be seen, and it also dived on the Rufus King. So and thank okay. you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. A waste of readers' point. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, so, and Jack said here, the two men lost in the Tambar incident are buried at Tawong Cemetery, but not together. One is in a war grave in that front section, the other's buried in a non-war grave, as his mum was so blamed, the RAN, oh. she did not want him to be put in the war section. Okay, that's a shame. <clears throat> yeah.